All right. Uh, welcome to another episode of PT Meal Physical Therapy Podcast, a smorgasbord of inspiring insights and information about the physical therapy profession and practice from the perspective of Filipino physical therapists. This is your host, Johan De La Paz. And for this episode, we're going to reach new heights because what we'll be talking about is space. So I'll say that again, space, physical therapy and space. How cool is that? So to help us know more about it, um, let me introduce my guest, Dr. Jojo Saison. He is a physical therapist, a doctor of manual therapy, and a fellow of American Academy of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapists. He is a research scientist, consultant, co-investigator in the NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, IV team, which studies the risk of intervertebral disc damage after prolonged space flight. He is also the human performance consultant in Project Blackbird, a U.S. initiative in building a rocket car powered by hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide propellant. He is also the founder of Project Michelangelo, which we'll be talking about uh, also later. He is president of Jojo Sison's Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation. And he is also an instructor in the Doctor of Physical Therapy in Orthopedic Manual Therapy Program in the Ola Grimsby Institute Consortium. Wow, that's a lot of achievements. So here is Dr. Jojo Sison. Jojo, welcome to the show. Oh, good morning, Johan. And magandang um, umaga sa inyong mga Filipino physical therapists out there. First, I just want to commend you, uh, Johan, for doing this. Because we need Filipinos who, who are um, movers and shakers and uh, thinkers who can expand uh, not just the profession of physical therapists, but also to raise the flag of the Philippines. Na kaya ng Pinoy. Yan ang ating mantra. Battle, battle cry natin yan, Johan. Right, kaya kaya talaga ng Pilipino. So that's kaya also na- one of my objectives here is because uh, I've been hearing a lot of uh, foreign physical therapists na, na podcast and I th- I thought like, there's a lot of physical therapists or Filipinos who are doing uh, good or better than that. So I want to uh, showcase the Filipino talents and in and, and physical therapy especially. So um, before we start our discussion on on how you got into NASA, NASA research, and your research about the intervertebral disc. Could you give us a b- brief background on how you got into physical therapy and, and what led you to that path to becoming a physical therapist? Okay. Alam mo, naka, nakakatawa eh. Um, by the way, an- ano bang gusto mong language? Do you want Philippine, Tagalog, or you want English? Uh, siguro for the, English. For huh? siguro English. English. Uh-huh. Okay, okay. So we'll do it, we'll do it in English. Uh-huh. So that uh, we have more reach for those who are not that precise in uh, speaking the Tagalog, lang- uh, Tagalog mm-hmm. language, okay? okay? So how did I start physical therapy? It is because of Barkada. Mm-hmm. Of course, uh, Barkada is our, is our smaller unit of uh, family or mm-hmm. friends. Uh, I graduated to say, in uh, the University of Santo Tomas. Um, I graduated in high school in 1980. So that's a long time ago. So I'm probably uh, as old as your father. <laughs> um, and then uh, from then on, um, I wanted to become a surgeon. That was what I uh, wanted to go to, uh, to, med- to medical school. Uh, so I needed a, a, um, a, a pre-med course, mm-hmm. right? And most of my barcada, which is just a few of us, they all went to physical therapy. And I said, why, uh, uh, you're going there, where am I going to go? I'm going to go with you. So it's almost like serendipity. <laughs> now I ended up going to physical therapy. And plus, uh, I really enjoyed uh, the human body, how it works. I'm just in awe. Kaya sumali ako physical therapy for a pre-med course. Mm-hmm. But when I graduated physical therapy, things started to change. Somehow... I was pulled not because I did not want to become a surgeon, it's because of economic reasons during that time. Uh, because my father, uh, like most of the fathers of our, of our Filipino PTs, they had, they had to sacrifice. That's one thing good about our, our culture. The father of the family will sacrifice and do their best to get their children through school. And my father did that. He was an engineer, he went to Saudi Arabia. And I realized that he was spending for my education as well as my brother and sister. And it was 
it seems unfair that he had to leave the Philippines eight months or 10 months out of the year to be in a foreign land just to, just to uh, send us to school and feed us. Mm -hmm. So um, my father said, uh, don't worry, I will send you to college. And I, I was accepted in the USD Medical School. Uh, uh, my grades were high enough where I did not have to take the exam. But I told my father, uh, Dad, I think you better go come home and uh, let me work. Yeah. So it's by the, our, our, the beautiful Filipino culture, which we call the unspoken demand. I'm, I was the eldest of three. And it seems like we have this, res this innate responsibility to take care of our family. So I just asked my, my father to, well, it's, uh, can, I, can you just uh, lend me some money? Uh, it was only $600 one way to the United States. But of course, it took about one year to arrange the paper. So, so eventually, it was because of my friends that I end, ended up being a physical therapist. So I decided if I could not be a, be a medical doctor, I will still pursue this in another avenue. I knew something big was waiting. But it, and, it, and this is what I want to talk about later. It's the human spirit. What is it? What makes somebody move? So in a nutshell, that's what it was. Wow. <laughs> so it wasn't really uh, a choice back then, but your friends pulled you to that direction, which is a good one. Yeah, that's why you have to choose your friends, because if your friends um, want you, uh, they go somewhere where it's, it's really uh, disrupted to your soul, then you will be them. But of course, I thought it was really a good idea as well. And my, I, I chose my friends. Mm -hmm. that's right. uh, they were good people. <laughs> So uh, the, the first time I heard your name was uh, back in 2016. I was new here in the U.S. And I, I, I think I, I, I saw a Facebook post uh, about your speaking engagement in USD, about uh, your uh, role in NASA and, and the research in uh, your research work in NASA. So before we go to the actual, uh, actual role, so how did you land that? Uh, position as a research scientist for NASA? Okay, well, um, we have to understand that every single thing that we love in this life and who you have become have come from your childhood. Mm -hmm. um, all, all the astronauts that I've, uh, I've talked to, had coffee with, it's when, um, let's say one of them, uh, astronaut Mike Mullane, uh, when he was a young boy, he played with rockets. You know, he mm -hmm. would fly these model rockets and he ended up being uh, an astronaut. One of my good friends, Scott Perezinski, he was one of my, the Hall of Famers. He's, his father took him to uh, NASA and uh, watched the launches of the, um, of the space shuttles and he became uh, a space shuttle astronaut and he also became one of the, um, one of the uh, Hall of Famers. So my story was different. In, 19, in July 1969, NASA landed the first men on the moon. Um, that was Neil Armstrong and, uh, and uh, Buzz Aldrin. Of course, uh, Mike Collins was, uh, was flying the orbiter and waiting for them. So it was, uh, it was, this, it was a summer of uh, 1969, and I was six years old. Oh, wow. So my father um, asked me to watch it with him. So we watch it in this black and white TV, you know, those Zenith TV with the, with the, with the spindly legs and rabbit ears. And I, we watched it. And my father did not know that he was actually inspiring me and igniting what I, what, what I have to be in the future. So when I watched those astronauts come down and, and I was so enthralled, I was so, uh, I was taken aback like, wow, there are people on the moon. So when, when I looked out the window and I saw the moon and I could, I could almost imagine there are people on the moon. So uh, my father ignited me and many, many years later on the same launch pad where the Apollo, Apollo 11 launched, I was there to witness the last launch of, uh, of, the, of Discovery, a space shuttle Discovery. So when uh, it, so time it's like a time travel from the past 1969 to about 2011, I believe that was the last uh, flight. I was standing there, and when the space shuttle flew, I had suddenly I cried. I had tears in my eyes. Like I'm here. It's like and my and my father, of course, had passed away. So it brought me those memories. So it's it's the human spirit 
And then in 2015, I would shake the hand of Buzz Aldrin in, uh, in, uh, when I was a delegate of NASA. I, I presented two scientific lectures in uh, Jerusalem, in the International Astronautical Congress. So everything starts from being a child. Mm-hmm. That is why I have, I have an offshoot. I have a foundation project, Michelangelo Foundation. We're empowering children. You have to believe in a child. So in one, at one point, somebody believed in me. So that fire kept on, and I wanted to become a scientist and an astronaut. Uh, I applied three times for NASA to become an astronaut because there's no Filipino astronauts. Uh, but I have not been called. But somehow God is good. Mm-hmm. Because I ended up being a, a participant as a as a scientist for the space program, and and from from then on, I've uh, I've ended up having being friends with astronauts, and uh, in a really good friends where I can actually call him on a cell phone. So so again, in a nutshell, because we have a short program, that's basically what happens. I'm connecting the childhood experience. So mm-hmm. anyone listening here, for all your children. Believe in their dreams, nurture them, because one day it will, it will be because of you that they have become great in what they're doing. That's right. That's so, that's so powerful. So encourage your, your children to pursue their dreams. And that must have been so surreal to meet your, your idols, the, 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 the astronauts are being there in that landing, launching pad. Yeah, it, have... it, was, yeah it was surreal because... Uh, when uh, when when I do my lectures, uh, for example, um, when I lecture on uh, even children, and he showed to adults, I ask them a question: Can you touch your dream? Can you actually? And then they ask me, "You mean touch it? Like touch?" Yes, I'm asking you. Do you believe you can touch your dream? And everybody says, "Well, no, you can't touch a dream." So I asked them, do me a favor, hold a pen, hold a book. Like for example, uh, you, Johan, hold something, a pen or something, something physical. Okay, mm-hmm. let's, let's do that. You are holding a pen. Think about this. At one point in time, that pen was only an imagination of someone who wanted to invent it. Uh-huh. You have it now. Mm-hmm. So the, the idea there is, is a complex idea to step out of the box. Mm-hmm. So I teach that as well. So because it will empower you to do great things, not only in your profession, but into other things in life, anything you want. And uh, oh, in fact, the, most, the major secret I have is really God. You have to place God or Jesus Christ before, ahead of everything you do in life. And he will guide you. So that's a, a, a nutshell again. Lat na answer kasi mga concept parang mahaba. It looks, it sounds like it's long, but it's actually short because uh, this, this comes in a book, <laughs> right? But it's it's good because we're talking about the concept. I mean, context of how you got there, what inspired you. So that's nice. It's you, you, you're giving us a glimpse of what was your thought process, what 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 motivated you in in pursuing your dream. Okay. Now, I, w- I want to uh, connect uh, and answer fully how I got to NASA, okay? Mm-hmm. Because what I told you was the, was the motivation behind it. Mm-hmm. Because I'm, I'm asked commonly by physical therapists, uh, even uh, from, from all over the world, Sir, Dr. Jojo, how, what is the process to get to NASA? Mm-hmm. Because everybody is in that frame of mind that you need to have a template. Step one, step two, step three, step four, step mm-hmm. five. As in right. how to become a physical therapist. You right. finish high school, you take your, your pre, um, pre-science uh, courses, you go into physical therapy class, and then you graduate. You take the board mm-hmm. examination, you apply. That's the template of how mm-hmm. to become a physical therapist. Yeah, clear now, process. Yeah, there's a process. But people are surprised when I tell them there is no direct way to NASA from a physical therapist to working with NASA. There is none. Mm. Because we are so comfortable. We want to be comfortable that we know the steps, right? Uh, and then it's laid down in front of us, here are the steps. But there's something greater than that. You have to believe in something greater than yourself. And that begins with God. Now, I ask, um, I ask uh, 
uh, scientists uh, scientists like uh, like how did they get there of course uh, there there's a template and one major thing i thought of was if if you really want something so badly you need to believe in it and believe that it already has happened that's uh, that's really true so when i believe uh, believe in that i wanted to become the well it was a very big dream the best physical therapist in the world big dream mm -hmm. uh, that's why you can never laugh at a child's dream or anyone's dream so i searched for the best physical therapist that i could that in my category would be the best you know i found him his name is ola grimsby mm -hmm. i could not find anything anyone who can compare to him he's a genius his way of thinking was completely radical so I joined him and he accepted me as his first uh, manual therapy therapist, um, Filipino manual therapy student. Oh, huh. so, um, so I was the first one to graduate in the Philippines as a doctor of manual therapy. Uh, this is uh, considering the only, the physical, a manual therapy, Filipino manual therapy is not with the weekend course. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a degree. So I've, uh, I've uh, got, I've gotten uh, three degrees uh, to all the Grimsby Institute. So through there, uh, I learned what you call, it's not like a, putting the procedures. No, it's about critical thinking. So this is something that we need to harness because we are so capable of doing this. If you can, if you can merge your knowledge, scientific knowledge, and you, you know how to screen the bad knowledge and the good knowledge, and you're able to connect that with your skill, and then you become a competent clinician. Right. Anybody can be called a clinician, but who is competent? So that's a competency is not just doing what uh, the, the correct diagnosis and the treatment, but there's also a, per, a professional intuition. It's an intuition not on the not only in the pathology, but as the uh, but of the spirit and the human being and the connection to your world. So it started from there. Then uh, to be and to become a scientist, I asked another scientist, somebody who became my mentor, Dr. Alan Hargens. He's actually a uh, world-renowned uh, NASA scientist. He's awarded the highest award, the civilian award. And what I learned from him is that you, uh, you need anyone, I'm not just a physical therapist, need to present something that NASA does not have. And you go for it. So by the grace of God, as, as much as you want something, God will provide. And it's scriptural. He said in scripture, as a man thinketh, he becomes. And if you have, if you have the faith of just a mustard, a grain of mustard seed, you ask that mountain to uproot itself, throw itself into the ocean, and it shall follow your command. You know, it's it might sound allegorical to people, but it's actually true. I believed in that. So what happened? It's amazing. Somehow I got to meet Dr. Hargens, and he he had a lecture on exercise on space. And one thing that struck me was that. He said, the astronauts develop back pain in space and NASA does not know why. And I had this pull from, uh, I believe is the Holy Spirit saying, Jojo, you can, you can, you can, you can solve this. So I, pres I uh, spoke to Dr. Hargens. I said, Dr. Hargens, I think I know why. Then I, I realized there's another uh, way of doing this. He basically told me, you can't just say that. You have to prove it by a peer reviewed study. Mm -hmm. A peer-reviewed study. Never done this before, yeah. right? That means you don't just set a, set a concept. You know, it has to be reviewed by the, the best minds in the world. World. So I, uh, what I learned from the Ola Grimsby Institute, that critical thinking was so crucial because it was these were stepping stones, and I was able to write a um, a most probable theory. So it became the the research paper. The uh, theory of low of um, low back pain, or pathophysiology of low back pain with exposure to microgravity. So I asked Dr. Hargens, and I know he's been, he's he's published uh, into the thousands. So I was uh, in a way I was a little uh, afraid to show him what I have, because uh, nobody wants to be rejected. <laughs> nobody. Right. But you'll never know until you, if you find out. So um, I sent him my information. And uh, he, he answered back an email. And it's very typical for high-level thinkers, uh, in my experience, even astronauts. They're one-liners. 
Okay, Filipinos like to engage in a flowery talk. It's a long one, but they're one-liners. Just like uh, Schwarzenegger's, I'll be back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> one-liners. So when he read my, uh, my proposal, Dr. Hargan said, he emailed me. He said, this is good stuff, period. <laughs> I will write this with you. Wow. So because... Because you wanted it so badly, you believe God will actually give you the, the pathway, but you have to grab it. So I have all this basic information I can build. And I wrote and I wrote and I wrote, so, and it has never been written before. So NASA didn't know. Even a, an astronaut I uh, met in 2006 who, I, who trained me for zero gravity in training in a parabolic flight, he said, well, I have back pain. NASA doesn't know. So I started writing, and then since nobody has ever written on it, my paper was heavily criticized. And it went through all parts of the world to these, uh, from astronauts to high-level scientists. And see, when you write something, you, uh, you have them review it, and they, they, sh they shoot it back at you with a lot of excess that I don't like this, this is not true, I have to rebuild it. It took me, Johan, it took me eight years to write, to write and publish this. Oh. Eight years. Can you imagine? I, I could have just... I could have just uh, given up in the first year, like nobody wants this. So I'm teaching your listeners that if you are passionate enough, you have to push through. And uh, on the eighth year, it, be, it was published. The, wow. path of the, the theory on the pathophysiology of back pain, of low back pain and microgravity. And somehow it, was, it went, it was almost like viral. Now there's a theory, and uh, like because I wanted it, I wanted it to be the pivotal point. Mm -hmm. So when I was done, I was assisted by Dr. Hargan. So that that meant I was an I was a volunteer, uh, in a way, volunteer scientist. That was in 2000, published in 2008. Then after that, NASA usually launches a um, a what you call a call for papers. Mm -hmm. What they do is they make a call for uh, researchers, and they they state what their problems are that they want to find out the answer. And one of them was during, in 2008, exactly in 2008, NASA wants to find out the damage of intervertebral disks in uh, space flight. So all the scientists from all over the world were trying to set their, uh, send their proposals, okay? So that they can uh, be given a, um, a formal designation as a scientific team with, with some funding. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dr. Hargens asked me to write, help write the proposal. So I was writing it. I had a deadline, and he, and he said, and I asked him, "Why do you want me to help you write this?" And he said, "Because uh, you're you're the most knowledgeable on this." So he he uh, designated me as a a a, bi a spine biomechanics expert in microgravity, just because I was the only one who knew who knew about it. So I wrote it when it was when we were accepted in 2010. That was 10 years ago. He mentioned to me that that. Um, that the research I had was the main reason, the most likely re reason why NASA approved our team. Okay, because, and this is, a, this is a kind of funny, when I was doing the, um, the review and, and I was preparing the, this, this proposal, I, was, I had the, bio, the bios and resumes of all the other scientific teams. Mm -hmm. So these are doctors and scientists from, from UCSD, UCSF, um, from all sorts of uh, pre prestigious universities. And I saw there, there's a category there, let's say, how many peer-reviewed studies have you published? And I looked at all of those scientists and I saw hundreds to thousands per scientist. Oh, wow. And I was like blown away. Like, gosh, these are like really like brilliant people. Mm -hmm. and, I, and it came to my resume, Johan. And then I have to answer that question. So I typed my answer. I had one. I had one peer-reviewed study. Oh. But that one was the reason why NASA accepted us. Right. I had one research, but it was the one that was the bullseye. Mm -hmm. So now, whenever you, you experience success like that, you, you step back and realize it was not you. Then I realized wisdom, which, which told my mind, God will not call the qualified. He will qualify 
the called. So from then on, I even offered everything, every page, every word I make, I offered to something, someone greater than I. Because I realized the secret to, to, to this, especially for those listening, is that if you bow down to God and realize that it was never you, you remove your pride, you remove your arrogance, it was not you, but it was only given unto you, the more he will give unto you, not for your own sake, but for the sake of others. In this case, for the sake of astronauts, for the sake of the other researchers who will use this, for the sake of the physical therapists who will glean information from the research I'm doing, and furthermore, for the Philippines, Kaya ng Pinoy. Right. Wow. It's a powerful story. Very inspiring. Grabe. <laughs> Grabe. After now, Johan, I'm still taken aback. You know, I I still have goosebumps. I still have goosebumps every time I think about it. Right. And it's not done yet. I'm, I'm, not, mm. I'm not done yet. Mm-hmm. As, long as, you, as long as you live, you can, uh, you can, you can do so many things. Okay, I can diverge topics. Eh, and, uh, right. yung, 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 not just the power of belief. There's actually science behind it. Be, believing, believing in God is scientific. You know, and, mm-hmm. yeah, okay, I can't, uh, there's so many things I want to tell you. You ask me. Mm-hmm. And I'll answer it to the best, uh, my, best of my abilities. Well, Kanina, you were explaining that you were, uh, it took you eight years to complete that, that initial study, right? Uh, were there any times that, that you said to yourself, like, I wanted to give up? Or are there any moments that I want to push through, be, but I'm having a hard time? So what, what made you go through that eight years until you reach that goal? What helped you through that? That because that eight years is not it's not a joke, you know. It, it's you can do a lot of things in those eight years, but what really got you stuck into that? I, I'm gonna stick to this, uh, pursue this, and I'm not gonna give up. Okay, that's a really an excellent uh, question because so many people when they stumble, they give up. Okay, mm-hmm. so most of the time you glean some history on uh, on the most important people in uh, in history. For example. Uh, when we talk about Thomas Edison, okay, everybody, in, I hope everybody knows who Thomas Edison is, the, the inventor of the light bulb, right? Mm-hmm. So Thomas Edison, the genius, he said that when he developed the light bulb, it was his 1,000th try. He failed 999 times. Just imagine if you stopped at 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 the uh, trial number 25 then you would have lost it so this shows the power of god and the power that what he gives us if only we believe that's why if you are committed to your dream and to your passion you have to commit that's why you have to believe it already happened because everything else will be a distraction and you have to uh, you have to redefine because I started redefining things. Mm-hmm. For example, I don't believe in a problem. No, everybody, a lot of people have a problem. They cry, they have a financial problem, or whatever. They cry, no, a problem is nothing more but an opportunity. Wow. It's an opportunity. So the moment, so I, I kept that definition, definition in my mind all the time. So if I have a rejection, or let's say half of my paper was rejected and uh, a scientist from, let's say, from Sweden saying, uh, this is not right. It was my opportunity to prove that I was right. So I made modifications. I I found more research. I put it all together. And uh, when I submitted it in Aviation Space and Environmental Medicine in 2008, there was a limitation on uh, the research, right? The the word count. The limitation was... uh, uh, no more than 5,000 words, word count. Okay. Since so many scientists were wanting to change it all over the world, it blew up to about almost 10,000 words, <laughs> word count. Because I have, to, I have to respond to these scientists, right? Right. So now I'm, the paper is basically disqualified from being printed, right? So now there's another, there's another um, uh, uh, obstacle. hurdle, hurdle, mm-hmm. obstacle. But, I so believe that this information was so powerful that they're not going to throw this away. So the editor-in-chief of uh, Aviation Space and Environmental Medicine sent, uh, sent me a message. 
He said, Dear Dr. Sason, I really want to publish this. Can you make this 5,000 words? <laughs> so that means I have to cut the almost 10,000 words, half of it, to make all the information fit in right. that 5,000 words. And I said, no problem. <laughs> because I believe I can do it. And it's not just me. This is a lesson for humanity that anyone can do pretty much anything. Sometimes it's not how you expected it. Sometimes God works in very mysterious ways and he will provide. And then I was able to, it was published. Mm -hmm. And there, and then it's been, uh, from then on, it kept on blowing up to different uh, researchers. You can find it in cite, cited in so many papers. This uh, paper actually was, uh, was uh, downloaded and read, um, I think, like uh, 3,000, at least 3,000 times already by, by different uh, universities. So, so it's about, uh, so it's not about giving up. It's, a, it's for fools. The moment you give up, you're done. Mm. However impossible it seems like, if you believe in it, just like what uh, God said on uh, the, the, the grain of mustard seed, you can do anything. You know, Johan, uh, you know that standard information is that we have a brain, mm -hmm. we only use 10% of it. Right. Standard information, kind of. Um, don't believe in that. Okay. I believe that you can use almost 100% of your brain. And how it works is really simple. It's actually shown in the science of epigenetics. Okay. Mm -hmm. It means that your body, your biological systems will adapt based on the environmental factors. There's also... Um, uh, some research and uh, lectures by uh, Dr. Lepton that I listened to that in the epigenetics, if uh, you, your DNA has information, right? Okay. Sometimes the DNA will have information that you may, predis you may be predisposed to cancer, for example, for lung cancer. And then, and when, when, when it's analyzed, then, then you're going to get scared that you're going to have developed lung cancer, for example. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing what, the belief system does on a DNA. It can either express or not express. So even from the, the DNA and even to your brain, if you believe that you will use 100% and you actually really, really believe with passion, it's, you start becoming genius. The things that uh, will express as a disease will not express a, as a disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why one other thing I don't believe in is the word aging. Mm -hmm. Everybody looks, if you look at your picture 10 years ago, like, wow, I look so young, right? Hey, hey. Johan, I'm, uh, next month, I'll, I'll, I'm 57, next month. Wow. But I can still out bench press and out climb uh, just about everybody in the gym. Mm -hmm. And I, I have not been colorizing my hair and you know, everything <laughs> because my genes are expressing youthful, uh, youthful cells mm -hmm. because I believe in it. That's why the power of belief is so crucial that it's actually scientific. Mm -hmm. Want me to prove it to you? Yeah, sure. Okay, all right. Now, in quantum physics, um, it's so bizarre and, and people know what quantum physics is, right? It's the measurement of the of our study of the subatomic particles, right? It's called quantum physics and quantum mechanics, right? Quantum physics. <laughs> All right. Quantum, right, okay. Now, uh, we know what reality is based on what our senses tell us, based because of our consciousness. Now, yeah. there's, there's height and there's length and there's volume and you can feel yourself and there's that's three dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. Height, length, uh, width, and then there's a fourth dimension, which is time. Time moving forward. Uh, and, and time is actually divisible to the smallest amount. And reality, that like the solid phase, can be, di can be divided to the, smallest, to the smallest particle. And it's not the atom. It's actually a small, a small piece of reality where it's still solid. It's called the Planck length. P-L-A-N-C-K, Planck length. It's one times 10 to the negative 34. Really small. And that's indivisible. If you divide reality, 
if you divide that plank length smaller than what it is, it will not make sense anymore because it's not real. Because the subatomic particles are energy. It's, you cannot touch it. An atom is 99% empty space. Therefore, you are 99% empty space. You are an, an illusion. Wow. The whole things we think about reality is basically an illusion. So now I'm, I'm telling you this because I'm, I'm heading, heading to, uh, to belief, right? Mm -hmm. The power of the consciousness. There is a, um, a, um, a conundrum in quantum mechanics. It's called the, uh, the measurement principle, uh, the, measure, the measurement problem. Okay. We have developed these, these, uh, these uh, instrumentation that you can actually take a photograph of an atom. Okay. Right, we have we, we have that, and it's yes. uh, it's not like our textbook atom. It's like a grainy, fuzzy clouds. You, we can actually take a picture of an atom. So this is the pro the problem measurement, and all sorts of uh, scientists, especially secular scientists, try to prove it. And they have no idea how to prove it. It means that you can take a picture of an atom, but if you take a picture of the atom without anyone looking at it, without anyone. It's not there. Oh. But if you have an observer, it's there. Okay. So the atoms are not there if there's no one aware of it. Right. So, and then, so we really need that the, the, the presence of this, this divine, uh, divine piece of entity we call God. We are parts of God. Mm -hmm. And the mind that we have is something beyond those four dimensions. You cannot contain the mind. Like, how do you measure your mind? Uh, we, like, huh. I can talk, we're talking right now. You're in California, mm. I'm in Illinois, but mm. our minds are one and the same. We are overlapping in our communication. We, it's not bound by time. It's not bound by, by distance. You can, you can think about your loved one in the past who passed away already, and you can, you're still one with them. It's not bound by life, even by the life that we know of. It's right. boundless. That means the mind belongs to another dimension, which is the dimension maybe around what God is, some, something, an absolutism. Because in, uh, in physics, we, we, we know four dimensions in, uh, in Einstein in physics. But in uh, the whole of physics, there's up to 26 dimensions. Wow. In string theory, there are 10 to 11 dimensions and we are only aware of four which are right length yeah. height, width time uh. in fact you can probably do fifth if you talk about the mind so the, the power of the the things that that happen is called uh, i call the matrix of possibilities mm -hmm. okay so when uh, when when we talk about what you want if you want it intensely enough it will come to you. And I know you've, this happened to you. I'll prove it to you. There are many times that you want to do something and you believe in it. Suddenly you meet the right people. Some, but sometimes you'll have somebody call you and then well, I was thinking about you and you will find something that sort that you need for that project. It will just come into place. That's right? true. Yeah. Right. And uh, you're gra it's called, I call it gravitating the, the matrix of possibilities. That's why believe like a mustard seed. And this is how it happens. What it controls in the things in life, even our passion for physical therapy, is your passion. Passion is an emotion, mm -hmm. right? So if we compare that to Einstein and physics, space, like what we have right now, space and time, they're intertwined. They're one and the same. So if we talk about gravity, for example, uh, everybody believes gravity, but they don't see gravity. They see the effects of gravity, but you don't see it. If let's say space and time was hypothetically made into a rubber map, let's say a trampoline, you know, a tight trampoline, that was mm -hmm. that's space and time. We, mm -hmm. we reduced our reality to a two-dimensional space time. Mm -hmm. And you place a heavy bowling ball in the middle mm -hmm. of that, of that uh, trampoline. So it will bend, the, yeah. it will sink the trampoline, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the example of if, if you have mass in a space time, it will deform the, the space-time continuum and it will form the gravity. If you put a baseball on one corner, it will, it will roll into the heavier mass because mm -hmm. it deformed it. Mm -hmm. So you displace space and time. Now, if we go to the quantum world about, about the matrix of possibilities, everything's happening or the, the possibilities of things. If your passion is strong enough and is stronger than anyone else, 
it's like displacing that matrix of possibilities. You will gravitate the things that are of the same resonance of your passion. As much as people who want to do evil things, they will resonate the same evil people, the same bad conditions. They will gravitate it. Right. So it begins. So you can never really do good things at the top if you cannot be that good thing. You need to have the exact resonance and you need to be the strongest resonance so that you can gravitate in the matrix of possibilities. As much as you wanted to do this uh, podcast to enlighten physical therapy, suddenly somehow I come into your life, you hear about things. It's, I, I was gravitated to your passion. Mm-hmm. And then through this, we gravitate people toward you, toward your dreams of, of uh, how, how do you uplift the next generation physical therapists. We need to break their paradigm of thinking. This is what it's all about, uh-huh. how you believe your reality. Because right. the paradigm of thinking in the in typical Filipinos is you, you're born, you go to school, you respect your parents, you finish college, you uh, earn money, have a family, raise your family, go old and die. Yeah. How pathetic. Is, is that what life is all about? So what, when people... what so. People are always looking for the purpose of life, right? What is the purpose of life? Johan, it's so simple. The purpose of life is to give it away. Wow. You give it away. Mm -hmm. The moment I realize I I give it away, like I'm giving my time to you, I'm Mm -hmm. giving my time to the next people. That's why when you ask me, um, uh, if I can, uh, of course, no. If I can do something, to give my life away piece by piece by piece because in the end, this is a complete difference in paradigm. Everybody wants to grow old and die with so much uh, stocks, money. Uh, We want to be convenient. We want to be comfortable. Guess what? The comfort zone is a beautiful place, but nothing ever grows there. Nothing. You have to either step out of your comfort zone or somebody pushes you out of your comfort zone. So make it a point when you start becoming comfortable in anything you do, step away. Mm-hmm. You challenge yourself, you make your spirit grow because in the end, it's, life is about finding our way back to God because that's where we belong. Right. <laughs> the whole thing, the whole thing that you said, I was taking notes. I was like, you're really explaining a lot of belief systems that I have come to know like, you mentioned earlier that belief changes your your brain. There was also, I think, uh, something I read before that that uh, whatever you believe, you you uh, you become like if if you're surrounded with negative people, you change your brain to become negative. Yes, and, yeah, absolutely. And also, you mentioned that like we are all illusions. Yeah. That yeah. That like whatever we're saying is just because of the inputs that we are receiving from our eyes, our ears, our nose, our mouth, but we're not sure if it's really there. It's just, yeah. it's just our, uh, our uh, what are you got, sensory uh, yeah. organs that, that yeah. are telling me that they're there. But as you mentioned, they are illusions. They're not really there. It's not really there. But in, uh, also in the, in the human spirit, we find meaning. Mm-hmm. You might see something and then you will give meaning to it. That's why that's the difference in our human soul. This, the human soul is actually, it's real and it's divine. Most we can have, that's why I want to change the paradigm of thinking. We all think that we're physical beings with a spirit. Mm-hmm. No, we are spiritual beings with a body. And in quantum physics, mm-hmm. it shows it shows that what we perceive as reality mm-hmm. is an illusion because it's only a holographic projection from a two-dimensional source of information. Mm-hmm. And everybody knows what a hologram is, right? It's a projection, three-dimensional projection. So in the, in, I, I don't discuss about um, the, um, the actual computational numbers because I'm not good at that. I only derive, the, um, derive and make sense out of the conclusions of what they gather. So we're actually a projection. So there, are, uh, the, all these theoretical scientists like are saying that we are being projected by some common source of information from a two-dimensional world, a two-dimensional uh, 
area, maybe a spherical area, and how do you know we're, uh, we're um, a hologram? And you can actually explain it. For example, if you look at the hologram of a um, credit card, there's a holographic projection right on the corner, right? Let's right. say a bird or something. If you cut that into to 100 pieces, okay. scrub it, and you look into a microscope, one small piece, you will see the whole bird. Really? Yeah, that's, a, that's <laughs> what the hologram is. You will see the whole thing. Okay. Makes now, me want to get my credit card and cut it into pieces. Yeah, that, that's what the hologram is. So it's amazing how one, one object or what appa uh, one apparent object, if you cut into pieces, it's still the same. If you look at the universe, you know, if you look at, um, let's say, if um, there are actually pictures of the far distant uh, the far distant reaches of the galaxy and beyond the galaxy. When there's a black spot or empty space, they look at it and they find these almost like cobwebs. And these are like so many, like millions and billions of galaxies that are interconnected together. They're like cobwebs. If you look at that and you look at the neurons of the brain, they are the exact same illustrations. So it's telling us that even in your brain, all that almost 100 billion cells, they are comparable in the shape to the distant galaxies, which are billions and billions of light years away. And for example, a lightning, you see a lightning, how it kind of, if you look at your blood vessels, don't they look like roots of the tree? Don't they look like lightning? You right. go, you go up to the atmosphere. You look at the river. They don't. They look like lightning with a with a fractal with a fractal um, branching. So right. we are we are holograms. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, I'm just making people think of the 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 paradigm is different. You have mm -hmm. to change it. Like we are not living in this life to go through it just to die and accomplish like everyone else is doing. That's called mediocrity. Right. You are meant. Everybody, you, Johan, the people listening, you are meant to do something great because we come from, we are a piece of the divine creator. That's why we are called co-creators. Mm -hmm. And how do we know we are co-creators? You are building, you are creating a program, Johan. Uh, somebody might be collecting something. Somebody might produce a garden. They create something because we are co-creators. We are ingrained to create, not to destroy. Right. So it's a paradigm of thinking. You can do so many things as a matter of how you believe in it. Mm -hmm. wow. Powerful, but true. That's right. <laughs> Actually, I, I could go on with, with uh, talking with you with like existential and, and philosophical things, but I don't want to be selfish. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have a time limit. You let, me, you let me know. I can always come back, you know, uh -huh. on a special occasion. Uh, when the time comes for traveling, um, at one time, I did a talk at the um, uh, the uh, California Physical Therapy Association. I was a um, I was a um, what do you call this? Um, the main speaker. I did that one time. So I, I even though I talked about um, science, I mm -hmm. always interject something about uh, something beyond what we mm -hmm. are, are are thinking. Because I'm so right. fascinated with the brain. Because God gave this to us, mm -hmm. and God did not make us completely all knowing. Because the first sin in the universe is pride. Right. We want to become like God. That's why the universe is so incomprehensible because God will, uh, God will make us, is making us humble. Mm -hmm. Humble means that you offer everything you do to him and to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And it's also um, nice that you said that the first sin was pride. Many people would say it's disobedience, not following orders, not eating, but it's really, you're right. It's, it's pride. pride. You wanted to become God, so you mm -hmm. want to be uh, better than Him. Correct. Yeah, <laughs> and that's a that's actually a, a small disease of our Filipino culture. It's like mm -hmm. uh, it's about me. You. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why people get hurt, you know, because we have this uh, what you call the Filipino mind reading mentality. Mm -hmm. It means that you are reading someone's mind, like siguro ganyan niya, siguro ganyan iniisip niya, ano papa tunayon ko sa kanila, I'll, I'll prove to them they're wrong. You're it's pride. Mm -hmm. Just let go. Mm -hmm. Right. If people can learn that, just let go. Because truth always prevails. Right. Let go. 
and follow your dreams. Don't don't mind anyone what yeah. what other other people are saying. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. You know what? Uh, I'll give you an um, example. Uh, just a, uh, do you have time? We sure. Yeah, time. I was okay. worried about your time. Oh no, I'm fine. Uh, I'm good for another ten minutes at least. But anyway, uh, God answers you in in many different ways. I I have told God, God, please send me to space. Uh-huh. I want to go to space. And I applied three times in the astronaut corps. I never got a call. But I somehow I was diverted by God to become um, a, a scientist collaborator. So when I was thinking, maybe God did not really want me to be in space. Okay. So one, so one time I have this, um, this, this envelope from an astronaut. And inside the envelope was this, the patch, the mission patch that I gave him. He was a commander of the space station back in 2013, I believe. And he took a picture of that patch by the window of the space station. He took a picture of it. And he, say, and he, can, he sent me a certificate saying that this, this uh, patch was flown by the Soyuz and it went through how many millions of miles on board the space station. My name was on that patch. So God, I was, I was like, wow, God. Lord, you sent me to space. You sent my name there. So I was actually contented with that. Mm-hmm. But no, God was, uh, it was not over yet. So one, uh, one uh, summer, it was summer Sunday last year, I was praying the rosary and I have a friend in space and I was praying for, I promised him I will pray for him every day. So I was praying for him that he would be safe. And on a Sunday, when I was uh, parked in a, uh, outside, it's called Seafood City. We have one here in Chicago. So I oh, parked in really? a Seafood City. I got an email from the space station. And the, and the email is from the astronaut I prayed for. And the uh, title and the uh, heading was, sub- subject was YO, Y-O, YO, exclamation point. And in it was an attachment, a photograph of me and him, our selfie together, Taken, I p- took a picture of our selfie by the window of the space station. And he said, I was just thinking about you. Oh. So and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lift this up and I'll show you. There it is. Oh, wow. So he sent me a picture of us by the space station. Mm. So God is, God is really very creative in surprising his children. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jesus clearly stated that if you cannot be like this, these little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. I... And it's about taking away your pride, dropping it, mm-hmm. and be the best of who you can. Because everybody listening here, Yohan, right now, mm-hmm. you have so much capacity to do good, to go to break the, the usual paradigm of thinking of who you are. And that you are, you are a celestial being with a human experience. There's so many things you can do. As long as you can, you're living, you can do so many things. You, can, you, are, you cannot limit yourself. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of people that I talk to, they say, I want to help you. I want to I, I a, make a foundation, help people, humanitarian work. When I'm rich, there's a condition. That's a paradigm. I started my project, Michelangelo Foundation, when I didn't have money. Mm-hmm. If I have to wait until I'm rich, when will it when will it arrive? Right, right. You, if you have passion, the Holy Spirit will uh, will tell you. You when you're ignited, you make this little fire to a bonfire. Mm-hmm. And the key there is to believe, and you trust, and you surrender to the Almighty Being, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That is actually the secret to all I do. Without yeah. them, I'll be nothing because everything I have was only given unto me. I did not achieve anything. So mm. for those saying that, oh, I achieved this and I want to achieve this, I think you're missing the point. Mm-hmm. God will allow you to achieve those things. It will be given unto you if you really believe and you acknowledge him. Right. So, like, <laughs> very, again, very powerful. So this is, so, but yeah, yeah, you said uh, God has given you this talent and with this talent, you came up with this study. Now we, let's go to uh, your, your your study, which is uh, 
the effects of uh, the risk of IV disc damage after prolonged space flight. So what is this all about? Well, the problem is that uh, there's a, a high percentage of astronauts developing um, low back pain and herniated mm -hmm. discs. Mm -hmm. Now, NASA uh, is uh, really concerned because if we have a, a mission to Mars, which will take six months to reach Mars, uh -huh. and then the astronauts develop a herniated disc, now they're incapacitated. Mm -hmm. You cannot bring them back. Right. So, so these are parts of the human factors to make sure that we have healthy astronauts. So there, there are, this is happening, but um, oh, oh, almost 70% uh, of astronauts develop this back pain in flight, before flight, no, in flight, during flight, and post flight. And the herniated discs are high uh, post flight, that means after they return. So the, NASA just needs to, needs to know the mechanisms because there are what you call countermeasures. Mm -hmm. Countermeasures are pretty much the solutions to, to mitigate those effects. So we have healthy astronauts and they're basically safe. So in the end, uh, we did uh, 10 years worth of study and uh, we're cranking all the numbers right now. My, my main goal was to, um, or my main mission there was, uh, I was the one who was collecting the, um, the um, raw data. That means I was the one meeting with the astronauts before flight and when they arrived from space. So we placed them in the MRIs. You know, we, uh, we have uh, two different kinds. One is supine, one is um, in, in MRI, with an upright capability, so we can actually measure the discs and the and the morphology of the spine, non-weight bearing and weight bearing compared to pre-flight and post-flight. So we compare mm -hmm. that. We also have a uh, fluoroscopy, wherein we have a mechanism that we're measuring the movement, the intersegmental motion of the spine with uh, the cardinal movements, except for rotations of flexion, extension, side bending, mm -hmm. and then we we compare that mathematically, compare that with the, with the computer before and after flight. So from then we glean numbers on uh, what's, uh, what's different and is there a, um, a high prob probability value or p-value. And then once those are defined, which we're actually defining right now, then we can have corrective measures. Then all of the other scientists can, can hone in. So mm -hmm. we are finding that there are changes, bone changes, there are discs cha disc changes, some of the discs are deforming, some of the discs are deforming faster some are actually herniating in space with uh, with their exercise countermeasures the muscles uh, shrink and um, most of the the types of muscles that shrink are very specific to type 1 muscles or we we call this the of course we 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 know this is the red muscles versus the white muscles and these are different morphologies requiring different biomechanical input so mm -hmm. in the in the realm of physical therapy this is very helpful because it's similar to uh, bedridden patients right so um, I, I had a lecture proposal of a possible uh, likely exercise and the principles of exercise in Cuba uh, last June 2019. I was uh, invited there to speak um, in, in, um, also um, as a delegate for NASA. Mm -hmm. So those are the main things. So, uh, but if you, if you ask me, what is it really that causes, there's actually one answer. There's, the, the results are very, very complex because there's so many variables to, the, to, disco right. to discover and to measure pre and post flight. It's actually what we call mechanotransduction. So this is the main reason. What it means that whenever we move on Earth, on Earth is called, called one G or one gravity. That's the, um, that's the comparison value. In 1G, like you can stand, you can move, and then the muscles can contract and compress the joints, and momentum increases. That, that force is something you cannot see, but you, cannot, you can only see the effects. Mm -hmm. Once the force is applied to biological tissues, the force is um, transducted to the nuclei of the, each cell to, to change the, to add or activate information to produce new cells that will be compatible to the biomechanical energy. That's why if you work out, the, the forces will, 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 uh, will activate your, um, your muscle cells, sarcomeres to produce thicker muscles, thicker collagen and so forth. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that mechanotransduction, it will shrink. That means every, the cells are always in flux. You can never have a muscle cell forever it will die at a certain amount of predestined time, then you have to produce another muscle cell. So the next generation cells 
have to always be compliant with the biomechanical forces. So it's the principle of mechanotransduction. If you bring an, uh, a human being into outer space, then you diminish or reduce or even uh, alleviate completely the mechanotransduction. Right. Now, that means now you're not walking, you're not giving compression, diurnal and nocturnal compression and decompression to the disc. Now you alter the uh, production of new cells into a weaker form of cell. Right. So when, when the discs uh, have, have overturned and the muscles and the bones and the ligaments, when you bring in them that, back to 1G from 0G to 1G, now all the forces are on, uh, now they are maximally overstressing the system. Now there is stressing the system to, to failure. Mm -hmm. And now that you have a pathology. So if you ask me one, one, uh, one answer to this or one variable, it's the mechanotransduction. So how do we fix it? We need to somehow, we have to somehow uh, copy or produce mechanotransduction that's similar because you really can't make it the exact same thing in space. Mm -hmm. Similar so that you can keep on, uh, you can keep on activating by um, having new cells uh, mitosis all the time in the right amount of um, of, of structural integrity in even even making it better and that 's why it 's kind of interesting so the bones in the spine the pelvis and the lower extremities seem to shrink you know lose their calcium because without the mechanotransduction you 're familiar with the wolf 's law wolf 's yeah. uh, law right the the yeah. um, direction of uh, of, um, of uh, osteophytes if you reduce that mechanotransduction, then you end up having more uh, more um, a resorption of bone rather than so the resorption is greater than the um, than the um, the production of bone so when you bring them down to um, to uh, 1g now you have a weaker structure it breaks mm -hmm. so we need to somehow do that if in space the weight bearing structures are in trouble right, right. Mm -hmm. but the, but the muscle but the bones of the upper extremities are okay because they're non-weight bearing. What, what do we do? Right. They pull, they use their arms, they use their muscle. So muscle energy, muscle contraction also is another force, another biomechanical force on the upper extremities. So uh -huh. you don't really have these osteoporotic conditions or osteopenic yeah. conditions to the upper extremities. Right. But here, here's, a, uh, here's something interesting. There is a part of the, skeleton, the axial skeletal system that actually thickens in space. Uh -huh. Which are? Interesting, isn't it? Like, yeah. what could thicken in, in space? Right. The answer, the cranium. Hmm. Because now you have more fluids. That's, uh, that's, there's no hydrostatic pressure anymore. There's more fluid uh, upflow toward the head. So there's more pulsation. So the pulsa it's been uh, um, speculated that the pulsations on, against the uh, cranium uh, is greater. So you're producing more bone formation in the cranium. So oh, when you live in space, you come down, you have a thicker head. Matikas ang ulo. Oh, wow. Right? So space is another animal. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. We need to know this because we are a spacefaring uh, and we are a spacefaring species. We, we, are, we are meant to explore. Right. And to explore, we need to survive. Correct. They said it's the next frontier. It, it is, and the last frontier. And I think there's um, too much science fiction to... Um, to um, that people don't think about the realities of space travel. Uh -huh. And uh, I, w I did a lecture in uh, Colombia uh, last year, Columbia, College, Columbia the, the, the country, Columbia, Columbia University. And I was asked, what's the main problem that astronauts will encounter when, uh, when they go to Mars, for example? Well, the problem really is radiation. Okay. Radiation means there's cosmic radiation. We have so much uh, subatomic particles bombarding us. As much as when you are exposed to x-rays, there are subatomic particles bombarding you, but only for a split second. There are subatomic particles uh, from the solar wind to the cosmic radiation that's hitting the Earth and hitting us, but it's filtered down and deflected by a magnetic field. The mm -hmm. Earth has a magnetic field, and it's called the Van, it's called the Van Allen belt. You know, they have a magnetic field, right. so it deflects it. And you know we have a magnetic field because the mag magnetic field are, are, um, are thinnest in the very uh, the polar caps of the uh, Earth. That's why when the when the magnetic field or and when the solar wind or solar particles hit the top and the bottom, it knocks out some of the electrons of the oxygen and the hydrogen, and therefore you see the aurora. Aurora, yeah. It, 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 when you knock out the electrons, it produces energy. Mm -hmm. So you see the blue and the green glow. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so it's showing you that our electromagnetic field is actually protecting us. Now, when you leave the Earth's confines, now you have a spaceship and you think about Star Wars and Star Trek, but it has no magnetic field to, to deflect it. So now that's the main thing. It's almost like getting an x-ray every single second of your life and or a PET scan. You're going to die. You're going to destroy the okay. DNA. So now the, that's the main thing. So it's amazing uh, what we can do. So to do that, it's either you shield the spaceship and you can see, and how can we shield? We need something, a thicker density um, element like lead, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem with lead is it's too heavy to transport up to make it to, a sp to a space, mm -hmm. from Earth to space. It's very expensive. And plus, once uh, subatomic particles hit lead, it actually produces a more dangerous type of, uh, of, of atom. So it's mm -hmm. actually more, it can kill the astronauts more. So you have to deflect it either by producing an electromagnetic field around the spaceship, like an, like possibly like an ion engine, or, or, or know the when the bursts are coming, like the 11, every eleven years the sun bursts, uh, we have a solar flare. The astronauts actually hide in bags of water. Believe it or not, water is a deflector of subatomic particles. That's why all their water supply are going to be probably positioned at the hull of the spaceship. And there would be a place in the in there where all the water supplies there. They go in there and hide. So that is a just just a little tidbits information that it's about the radiation, right? That and that's the most important. That's the the worst uh, problem that we have. And only these and the muscles and things. There are so many things. I hope I wish we had like a whole week of this. Right. <laughs> fluids to uh, fluid levels, even it deforms the eyes. It's not circle anymore. It's not spherical anymore. When you come back, it's now flattened. You know, that's why the, there's a change, and then you become you become far sighted, and there are changes in the in the ventricles of the brain. It changes because of the fluid flow. Some mm -hmm. of the ventricles actually enlarge, and it does not recover anymore. We don't know if there's any. There's no no neurological issues with that, mm -hmm. but of course, there's no real long term studies yet. Right. So there's so many things. But uh, going back to my study in our study, because we're a team, it's about the mechanotransduction. So all exercises mm -hmm. need to be very specific, even the amount of loading and intensity. It has to be specific to this, to this certain type of isoform of the muscle that's needing the most. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of just kind of creating something. And uh, it's a matter of giving the right amount of directional force to the parallel to the muscle fibers or the group of vector force of a group of muscles and so forth. Right. Have, have been, with your team, have you had any... Uh, proposal already how to counter that effect of of the the microgravity in space so like how can they at least try to counter that effect yes. yeah yeah well, I, I actually sent in my recommendations already uh -huh. um, the the astronauts have their own team of exercise people I've oh, okay um, the space station has what you call the A-RED, A-R-E-D, um, Advanced Resistive Exercise Device. It's good enough, but it's not specific to the spine. Um, oh. I inspected the, the new capsule uh, called the Orion. I inspected the inside of it, mm -hmm. and it's a very small space. So um, I made a proposal on what can be done there for the spines of the astronauts. And you have to think out of the box. Wow, right. You have to create and draw exercises that are, that when you look at it, like, what is this? Because you really have to think out of the box. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you start doing that, then you become smarter and smarter and smarter because your, your, your neurons start connecting and connecting and it's connecting in real time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just saying it just to, to, make, you, to make anyone feel good. And, and I actually had lunch one time with a, with a uh, Nobel Prize, um, Nobel Prize uh, nominee in neuroscience. Mm -hmm. And he said that in real time, you can see the dendrites form and connect to each other when you are learning in real time. It's observable. Oh, wow. That's why you can need to keep on learning new things. Mm -hmm. The moment a physical therapist becomes comfortable, like I'm going to work, he knows, that, you know, she knows what to do, and all the, all the in instrumentation and the exercise, and they're comfortable. They are not growing anymore, and nothing mm -hmm. grows there. Mm -hmm. it, and when nothing grows in you, that's a perfect recipe for depression. You will be depressed. Mm -hmm. If you're doing the exact same things, monotonous every single day, you will become depressed. Mm -hmm. That's why you need to st step out of the comfort zone, do something different, do new places, uh, go into new places, learn new things, talk to new people. Like what you're doing is really very good, not only for the physical therapy profession, but only 
uh, also for you. You're mm-hmm. engaging the minds of different people. Mm-hmm. You are making yourself genius. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you, you got one of my uh, objectives why I, I wanted to do a podcast. It's to to speak with with experts like you on in this topic so that I can well surf selfish reasons for so I can learn and also so I can share it to everyone who's also as curious as me. So I don't want to let you go yet until you discuss Project Michelangelo because I know this is this Oh is absolutely good, yeah. This is a good uh foundation and your your purpose and, and objective with well, this is really uh philanthropic. So I want you I want you to share uh, to everyone what Project Man- Michelangelo is. Okay, very good. That's a great, um, great question, and thank you for for plugging that in. Mm-hmm. Uh, people ask me how did I establish Project Michelangelo Foundation, mm-hmm. and the answer to that is Project Michelangelo Foundation was born out of corruption. Mm-hmm. Out of corruption. What do I mean with that? I'm sure a lot of our your listeners, uh, Johan, have helped somebody or have helped uh, in kind or cash to a foundation and and nothing was done or it was stolen mm-hmm. or you've helped somebody who did not appreciate it. Uh, I helped a foundation in the Philippines and raised half a million pesos to, um, to um, build a school for the Aita, Aita tribe. Mm-hmm. And it was never really built. And uh, the money that I raised were just taken in and spent by the people that I gave the money to. So it was, uh, it was the type of corruption that's very predominant in the Philippines. Who do you trust? Mm-hmm. Right? It seems like uh, you want to trust people and you want to do good. And then suddenly you do good and then somebody steals money from you. Right. Happens many times, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. It may have happened to you. Mm-hmm. So because of that, most people, this is the paradigm of thinking. Once niloko ka or somebody de- deceived you, the usual, the usual response is, you throw in the towel, I'm not going to help anymore. Baloney. I'm done. I'm done with people. That's our typical response. Right. Well, you have to go be- above the, beyond and above that. So I thought, I want to help, but I don't want to be duped anymore. Mm-hmm. I might as well do it on my own. So mm-hmm. I created Project Michelangelo Foundation. So the idea here is that I know that there's so many people out there wanting, wanting to do good in the sea of humanity. They're there. They want to do good. They're swimming out there, but they have no way of doing it. They don't know what to do. They have no real friends to do it with. So I created this hypothetical and allegorical ship, like an ark, mm-hmm. Project Michelangelo. So I'm fishing for people. You know, fishing in, an, in like fissures of men. I'm finding people who want to do good and they don't know what to. And I say, hey, I have a ship. I have a flag. It's built of trust. Everybody's trusted here. You cannot be one of us if you cannot be trusted. So I pull people from everywhere in the world to have a common goal. And this, is a, this goal is not just to help people, but also to help people, to, to help people in the name of the Lord your God. And Michelangelo comes from the word St. Michael. Michael, the root word, Michael, M-I-C-H-E-L, means to be like God or like God. So this is Archangel Michael who is Mm -hmm. like God. Mm -hmm. But he had humility. He did not have pride. He's following God. So I am encouraging the members to be like God, to be angelic here on earth. And from, from the very small ways from your family, and up to the outside world. And our main thing is children, empowering children. Because if you nurture a child and you make a child believe and and affirm that belief that the child can do anything, you will make that child do anything. In fact, every single child believes he or she can do anything. Every child, no exception. That's true. Until an adult tells them you can't do it. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're bobo. You're, you're, you're fat. You're thin. You're, you're not, you're ugly until an adult tells them they can't do it. Mm -hmm. So my goal is not just to inspire people, but to teach them, to teach them that there is a way It's empowering that the, in the, um, the paradigm of, um, of winning because the most of the paradigm of the Filipinos, if we go to the to our culture, we have a defeated paradigm. 
Mm-hmm. If you ask a common person, they just want to earn enough money so they can feed their family. They just want to have a small house. They just want to go abroad so they can they can just be uh, not to put anyone down, just to um, do menial work in a ship, maybe for example, or in a restaurant. They're not thinking big enough. Whatever they believe, it's defeated already. They will be like that because that's all they wanted. That's all they want, a small house. Why not a big mansion? Mm-hmm. They just want to help their family. Why not the whole world? So we have a defeated mentality. We, uh, we, we uh, show the children that that's all they can be mm-hmm. by, the, by the examples of these adults. So I'm teaching children that they can be more than what, than what they can. And I'm always, always asked as another question, a side question that is, Sir Jojo, how do you fix corruption in the Philippines? The answer is very simple. Number one, you wait because the people who are corrupt, one day they will die. You wait until they die. And everybody laughs, of course. <laughs> but in the meantime that you're waiting, you now start, uh, start training the next generation leaders, starting with children. That's how to fix it. Wait until they die. And while, while you're waiting, you start doing your work and teaching the children. Your children, the neighbor's children, everyone else, you believe in them, you empower them, you, you tell them, you tell them because it's so important that you, a, he, a child hears you, that you can do this. It's so powerful. Once a child hears that and they believe in that, the great things they'll do. And, it, and they'll, sometimes they'll even surprise you what they can do. So this is Project Michelangelo, um, www.projectmichelangelo.org. We have an offshoot. I have a magazine for women, mm-hmm. uh, empowering women. It's free. Uh, I don't charge anything. Uh, angelrisingmag.com. Uh, if people can, uh, some of your listeners can, can maybe look in that. If they want to get published, uh, it's only exclusive for women writers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if they want to get published, I'll do call, uh, contact me even through you. Uh, mm-hmm. And then I can guide them. So it's about, leaving your footprints in a, in a good way when you leave because we have to understand that we we are a finite people or finite beings we don't stay here in this life forever right so to give your life away as your purpose means that you've made this world a better place when you leave because that's when the time you really go home right it's building your legacy yes <laughs> Right. But we, we have, we have um, rescue missions all the way to Mindanao, and mm-hmm. we can talk on and on with this, but uh, I do, my, websites, well, my websites will show it, mm-hmm. and uh, anybody who would like to participate, even you, Johan, mm-hmm. you let me know, I can get you, because uh, we need people like how you think right. to empower children. So in fact, I am inviting you oh. to be part of Project Michelangelo Foundation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know the, the cause is really great, very, very out altruistic towards other people um you are your physical therapist research scientist philanthropist motivational speaker what else uh what is the next what's next for jojo oh what's next um <laughs> first of all uh, people it's so common um uh, when uh, when i get introduced or when i when I go to places where I have a formal introduction, uh-huh. people ask me what the, what type of all the things you said and more, yeah. what you, what's the best title that I am, I'm comfortable with? Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you what the title I want. Mm-hmm. Servant. Mm-hmm. I am a servant of Jesus Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. Everything else is a decoration. Right. So if you ask me what's, what's, uh, what's next, um, I cannot pinpoint because I'm so excited because it's a big world out there and I know there's more I can do. For one thing, I, I still want to go to space. So I think the next best thing I can do is, is um, go to the edge of space. And uh, my plan is to, um, within the next year or so, is to rent. I'm going to rent a uh, fighter plane, a MiG-29, and um, maybe and there'll be a backseater with a, with a pilot to go to the maximum height. And go, from there, I, I'm not sure what to do because uh, I'm going to use that for empowerment. Because mm-hmm. if you place yourself in, 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 uh, in times of place where you can die, 
That's mm -hmm. why I can, I have videos where I'm swimming with sharks or jumping off an airplane or whatever. It's not because of show off, because most people do this to show off. No, I want to feel the intensity of life by being close to death. And knowing that not, I'm not being crazy, it's calculated. I know that, that Jesus is holding me. And I know that I'm going to use this to, uh, to help people, to show them that there's really a way. You know, if, if people work, if work every day with their fears and they're, they're, they're prisoners of their own fear, they'll never get anywhere. Never. So the next uh, thing is maybe I just want to touch the sky for a little bit, physically touch the sky and go from there because I really want to do more. And while, I can, while I'm still breathing, while I'm still um, a young, uh, a young to be an elderly person, yeah, then um, mind, mind, body, and soul. And mm -hmm. I know I'm just, uh, to tell you the truth, I'm excited, Johan, because there's so many things I want to do, but I don't know it yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to show uh, people that if you follow and believe in God, that the greatest adventure in life comes with believing and believing and following and worshiping Jesus Christ first. That's where it all starts. Mm -hmm. The adventure comes with it. It's a bonus. Mm -hmm. Right, and and as you said, if things would gravitate to you. Whatever, what, whatever you you throw out to the world, it would also come back to you and gravitate to you. Well, yeah, yeah, it's a the, the lectures and when I lecture about this, it takes me several hours because I have slide presentations on how it works. Uh -huh. Because the moment you understand how it works, you'll do it. Right, right. <laughs> so I'm so excited for for what what's next for you, and hopefully we can talk more after this. Uh, in, in, in other episodes, next episodes. So uh, uh, as a conclusion, um, I asked this in, to, uh, to, to all my, my guests. So uh, what are the three ingredients that make up Jojo Saison? It can be like a characteristic, a value, a principle. So what is this three ingredients that you always carry with you each and every day of your life? Okay, uh, it's a fair question. I guess uh, the first one is is a um, a self realization that you are that you were created and you and you are and you have to be humble. I bow down to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. In fact, every morning the first thing I do in the morning is I physically kneel down and say to Jesus, "Thank you for my life." So, to, in a nutshell, it's gratitude. You need to have gratitude, every, not, every, not every day, but every moment. That's number one. Number two, I think it's, a, it's prayer. And most people think prayer is only like on a Sunday or when you, when you say the Our Father. No. Mm -hmm. Prayer is moment-to-moment -moment awareness that God is, was, and always will be. That He is Alpha and Omega. That He is in every fiber holding your subatomic particles together. And when you see anything, it's, it's in every wavelength of light. He is there. He's holding it. So the realization, number one, with, with gratitude. Number two, prayer. Constant communication. And the third one is action. All good things and ideas will be wasted if you do not act on it. So acting means mostly giving. Mm -hmm. If you give your time, if you give your whole self, you give your your energy to the next person, to the passionate, passionable things that you want to do in life, giving, and then you are co-creating when you're giving. So there you are. All right. Gratitude, prayer, and action. Very powerful. Actually, the whole episode is very powerful. A lot of wisdom that you've thrown out. Nuggets of wisdom there. So um, before I let you go, uh, where can people um, know more about your social media, your website, share them? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you Google Jojo Sison, S-A-Y-S-O-N, and then you add NASA maybe, you'll see pretty much about just about everything that you, uh, you would be interested in, even in mm -hmm. YouTube. If you mm -hmm. put Jojo Sison, you mm -hmm. will see everything there. But... Um, Facebook, I'm always there. I have uh, two accounts, a private account, and one is like a public figure account for my overflow. Mm -hmm. uh, just click on that Jojo Sison. 
uh, there's of course there are a few other Jojo Sisons out there. If you look in the Jojo Sison that I have, I always have the exact same profile photo, mm -hmm. and it has the longest resume. So it's pretty pretty clear. And the, my per, my personal page, you'll see me in my page picture. I'm kneeling because that's what I do every every day. And the second page is uh, you see me lecturing uh, with the astronauts in uh, in the scientific community. So social media would be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A website? And through you, yeah, and the website is uh, pro project, uh, project org would mm -hmm. be good. And uh, Michelangelo is M-I-C-H-E-L-A-N-G-E-L-O. So projectmichelangelo.org. Uh, you can, or just, just Google me Jojo Sash and you'll find me. Right. <laughs> I did. I did. There's a lot up there. <laughs> There's a lot up there. And I'm you have a lot of, like, you have a lot of uh, YouTube videos as well. So as a closing, what is, what do you want the audience to take away from our episode? To take away the, uh, from this episode, mm -hmm. place Jesus Christ before all you think, say, and do. And all these good things shall be added unto you one, one thing at a time, one day at a time. All right. Powerful, powerful. Again, thank you very much for, for lending your time, giving as yourself for, for this podcast. And I really appreciate what you've been doing uh, for like sharing your knowledge and, and doing your research and also helping kids out. So again, thank you. Great. Okay. And uh, for all your listeners and you, Johan, I bless you all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go live life. Carpe diem. Right. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Why? Thank you. Okay.